Okay, then the next way to use blockchain is more advanced, is like to use it as an internal database. And here, uh, the main problem that's being solved, yeah, aside from the timestamping issue and the integrity control, is that currently uh, digital systems do not allow users to exchange ownership of digital assets. For uh, the simple reason is that digital data is easy to copy, so easy to forge. And for example, everyone has seen uh, digital gift cards or digital uh, tickets to events. And uh, obviously, it's, uh, they just have the QR code. So you cannot really sell this on the secondary market. And uh, the issue is not just you know to sell, but uh, the data is not protected. You never know whether you have a copy of the data or it's like real. So the issue uh, can be solved when you use like a secure processing engine. So when you see the balance on the screen of the smartphone or the yeah, computer, then you know that the balance is correct, that it's not a copy of some of some other data. It's it's yours. So like now you can see it in uh, mobile over banking. And then this engine should allow the secure peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So this will, I will provide example. So this may look a little bit abstract, but this applies to like ticketing platforms, marketplaces for intellectual property rights, crowd investing, digital banking as well, access control and so on and so forth. And here solutions, uh, like this engine currently, the like, price of it uh, is like 50K and can be integrated within a few months. Then some clients asking for, to build the full infrastructure. So they don't have the infrastructure to say build us the full platform. And then the pricing yeah, the, for the ecosystem with partners, with uh, integrations, with mobile applications and design and security, everything, it's like half a million approximately. So uh, one example is like uh, electronic tickets and uh, yeah, gift cards and digital art. We have clients in all of these areas. One of them is uh, like art, digital art platform in the US. Uh, it's our client and for them, we built a system that allows to register digital art and uh, trade it and uh, use it as NFT on public blockchain as well. So in that case, uh, we solved the problem that yeah, digital things cannot be sold because they're easy to copy. And we build a ledger of ownership rights and whoever has the ownership right has yeah, the asset digital. So you now can maintain the relation like one owner, one piece of art, or one ticket. The next case, which is maybe even easier to get is like access control system that allows you to transfer access passes. So right now, when you come to, to visit some business center, they usually register you in the paper book. Uh, you write down whatever you like, you make a signature that let you go. And this process has a lot of yeah, issues. Like uh, first it involves a lot of like waiting, waste of time for visitors, many operations, and it's impossible to search through these records. So the owner of business center cannot do like real time risk management, for example. So instead uh, you can have a digital system. You even see the device on the screen. It is our joint venture. Um, with investors uh, that build such ecosystem infrastructure and then we install it in different locations such as hotel networks and office buildings. So the idea is that uh, if I'm an employee, I can send the pass to my guest, the guest will pre-register in the app and we'll just scan a QR code at the entrance. And you can have a security camera verifying that picture profile picture matches the face of the of the guest. Uh, you can add uh, you know recognition of the plate, license plate of the car, 
uh, and send the pass to the plate number. Okay, uh, now we come to this short uh, point where I want to explain how do we achieve like fast delivery. You will see more systems that take a limited amount of time, but deliver a lot of functionality, including applications, marketplaces, and so on. So for that, uh, we have a framework. It's called Token D. Uh, we built it uh, over years, basically like five years. We've been working on it, and eventually we delivered more than 40 projects, uh, different like in loyalty, digital banking, access control, e-commerce. And using this experience, we were uh, assembling uh, different like best practices, standardizing them, describing. And for example, the book that you've seen on the uh, first slide, Almanac, it's summarizing all the experience of, of ours, how to build uh, secure systems. So the framework has uh, a lot of modules. Uh, There's more than 30 modules. They have obviously a front end as well, like for reference, which can be changed. And uh, all these modules, they are assembled in a way to achieve like end result. So these are like bricks and steel and concrete uh, to build a building, plus the process of how this building should be. Uh, built like how strong should be the foundation how do you protect from lightning how do you do sewage and air conditioning and a lot of things so this is like our factory of building projects that helps us to to deliver this and uh, we do this through the network of partners as well so we have partners of three types or with whom we have joint projects like uh, consulting companies plus yeah, our capability to deliver or uh, legal yeah, advice plus hours plus consulting. So we assemble uh, ad hoc teams when, when needed and deliver projects and joint ventures. You'll see a couple of examples later. And we have partners that do customization of Token D. So the ecosystem partners that uh, build either mobile applications or front end or even back end. Etc. And uh, we have partners around the world who sell, yeah, this, who sell the uh, consulting, who sell the um, like the products itself. And we usually have 15 projects in parallel. So that's uh, how we achieve the results in many countries. So you can see locations. We have projects in Kenya and Argentina and Mexico, Malaysia and in India and in UAE. The next case that I want to cover would be uh, e-commerce. Uh, example of the client uh, soon will be yeah, published. It's a national retailer with 100 plus shops. It's a, not smaller, but yeah, big shops. And uh, they had no digital system. And when they decided to build one, they realized that existing systems already have like built-in issues. And these issues are there because uh, when e-commerce e -commerce platforms were built or ten, like designed like 10, 20 years ago, they were not the, e-commerce were not the main channel of sales. And uh, that time people paid much like less attention to security. So they had less this of this in mind. So the one of the main problem is that uh, you can hack a centralized system, steal all the passwords or other sensitive data, and then yeah, the kind of company will pay like fines to government for not protecting user data and so on and so forth. It's just one one thing. And even the bigger problem is that since now every all the trade goes online, you need a effectively ecosystem. You need to turn your clients into your partners and resellers. And that's what they plan to do. So they want, and we implemented that in the first stage, uh, so clients can buy, for example, uh, one ton of sugar online and then keep it on their wallet without any delivery. And then when the price of sugar goes up, to sell the sugar on the same platform. So it's something like Amazon, but for one 
uh, chain of uh, of shops that have the warehouses and all the infrastructure and the users uh, basically play a role of drop shippers they can do that or can buy themselves give the goods to friends and so on and so forth and yeah that seems to be a very interesting use case so effectively you can have um, a system with warehouses um, retailers with uh, wholesalers and yeah many chains in between but the goods will be moving only when delivery is requested before that only the ownership right for the goods will be moving uh, again Pavel, let me ask you a question this is uh, this is a very interesting case because actually what are you doing in this solution as far as i understand you can on the fly tokenize effectively any existing product that that is already in, in stock, let's say, of the wholesaler. And by doing that, you not just simplify uh, the, the existing process uh, in, the, in the retail, but you effectively add in new business cases or new business scenarios, because actually the role of the traditional buyer who is buying, let's say, a grocery from, from the supermarket is changing, right? So. So they can they they becoming trader. So the elder elderly people who are normally going there to buy their grocery by by this tokenization, they becoming the traders. Industries prosper as soon as uh, somebody gives users uh, freedom to create content or trade or something like that. So we see that in web web 1.0 was like one way uh, media to consumer, and web 2.0 is like consumers uh, create content and uh, then the role of the infrastructure provider is facilitate that not to even like case of facebook they don't create news they just support people who create news this is a very interesting case so the same will happen for trade so people will have the ability to trade with each other and best platforms support that I mean, Amazon is moving in that direction as well. They're just keeping it uh, like proprietary. And with the help of blockchain, it will be more like um, you know, open to connect. It's more like PSD2, but for trade. One case that I wanted to outline as well is like digital asset banking and, and custody. Um, it's very interesting for Switzerland and like Germany because uh, we see there are a lot of movement in digital asset custody, uh, such as can digital securities or Bitcoin or some other crypto assets. And uh, we have quite a lot of experience in that. We built uh, multiple exchanges around the world. One is like the biggest in Ukraine, for example. So client, we participated in tenders, uh, like German tenders for digital asset custody and uh, currently involved in a few projects. Uh, the issue there is that it's like cryptocurrencies and like crypto assets that have censorship resistant uh, feature, they cannot be recovered if they are stolen, for example, or lost. So you need to build a custody that has some threshold um, recovery mechanism. And you have multiple people uh, each of them cannot delete or steal cryptocurrency together, maintaining the custody. It's like in military systems, you have multiple keys to launch a rocket. So kind of the same mechanism, but very flexible. So we built such systems in order to store uh, like cryptocurrencies and digital assets in general. So that will be like it's a banks of new generation. So instead of uh, storing physical assets, now banks will store your keys, your keys of companies. So the next case that is going is coming up and uh, that will change how people invest is like securities marketplace. So we have five projects around the world, they're under NDA, so I cannot disclose, but all of them are striving for the same like need, how to simplify the IPO process for small companies 
and how to eliminate a lot of intermediaries in, the, in between. So for example, according to law, like Germany, you can do the mini IPO or crowdfunding on blockchain without the need of broker, without the notary, the blockchain itself can act as a notary, without a bank and without a custodian, the user will be doing self-custody of their own keys and without a bank because you can pay in crypto. So eliminating these four pieces, I mean, it's like very, it could be very narrow case. Um, and eventually there will be specialized parties to do the custody, to do not notarization in a more like interesting way. But technically by law, you already can do that. Eliminate all four uh, intermediaries and save a lot of money on fees and obviously increase the speed of the, pro the whole process. It's already happening. So different countries have different approaches, um, but the goal is the same. Like let's do automation, automation of risk assessment, automation of KYC and IML, automation of uh, transfers and uh, price discovery, automation of audit, doing it real time. So all these things. So it's like switching from paper mails to email. So the effect is the same, the message is delivered, but the means what you use to deliver a message, completely different and much cheaper and faster. So usually such projects launch uh, the first stage within like 50K and two months. And then within a year, they usually spend 200K uh, for some other features, many things. So they need to reserve the budget. After that year, system could be uh, said it's uh, complete, could be used only ongoing support maybe. Okay, we go to the last uh, piece. Um, when the most complicated, but we'll cover it more or less quickly, uh, but the most promising long term is when blockchain is used as the like interaction layer between um, companies. Okay, so last is uh, global. And this case is already also happening. To a certain extent, Ripple was trying to do so. Unite banks to build a decentralized SWIFT uh, and uh, some R3 consortium between banks is trying to do also the same, We're doing reconciliation between banks. So I will outline the, um, the most important pieces here and provide some examples. Uh, it is the problem is that when you have a need to maintain a ledger for a group of companies to do accounting or to do some kind of interactions, you need to select who will be holding this registry or ledger. And usually nobody trusts anyone to, to store all this sensitive data. They are able to change it. Yeah. Um, and kind of kill the business in some cases of the competitor. And in that case, you need to have some kind of a shared registry between companies that no one can change um, in a hidden way or nobody can affect or nobody can delete or something like that. In that case, you, you can use in blockchain, you can have a distributed registry between companies with real-time synchronization. So everyone will know that their copy is up to date, fully correct, and they can trust it. So applications could be state registries, registries of medical certificates, again, between countries, decentralized payment systems and trade finance. So usually like pricing starts here from like 100K and uh, more time, like four months. Uh, so for one client, uh, in GCC country, we built a registry and the whole system of tracking COVID certificates. And uh, the problem is that you can easily forge paper certificates. Or, yeah. And you need to have QR codes that look really verifiable, uh, that in, have digital signature to prevent fraud. 
and we built such an ecosystem. It, it's already operational, so every city, every person who flies in that country need to install the application and need to yeah effectively use that. So clinics are connected, border control is connected, and users connected. In that case, uh, the first version, like MVP, costed like 100K in four months. Then the production version costed like a few hundred thousand dollars and a few months more. And then evolvement is, yeah, it's basically functionality is unlimited. Uh, I think this, this use case, it's, it's extremely important nowadays. Uh, because it's uh, clearly part of the strategy, the global strategy of fighting the, the, the pan pandemics. Uh, but the major concern right now is interoperability of uh, systems like that and uh, acceptance of the certificates issued by different countries or in different geographies, by different authorities, and uh, to make the world move again. Right. So even though uh, you have this uh, this vaccine right now, or you did it twice, and you have a certificate, uh, will it be accepted in another country? Yeah, because all the systems and all the processes and protocols they're different, and unfortunately, you know, traveling these days, even within the European Union, it's extremely hard because, for example, different uh, airline carriers uh, they have different requirements. And here in Switzerland, for example, you have to be very, very uh, specific in asking for the, for the COVID tests, for example, because not all of them will be accepted by the airline. So the moment we will adopt massively the, the, the COVID vaccination and therefore a need for certificates to travel, we'll face a situation when there are hundreds of systems like that in the world. Some of them are the, the pretty advanced, like, like the one you built. Uh, some of them are, are, are pretty right, uh, legacy driven or maybe even paper based. So are there any ways how, how the blockchain can help addressing this, this issue? Like blockchain itself is a mechanism again, to protect the integrity and uh, protect the, I would say one country from another a little bit from manipulating the results. Uh, but I think what will enable more cooperation is like open APIs. As soon as standards for digital signature, for digital identity, and for just API to submit in the results and APIs to PCR machines will be established, it will be much easier. Um, so right now there are no such thing. So it's up to the owners of such systems to decide whether to open APIs or not. So obviously, everybody wants to build an empire, build their own system, yeah, and conquer the world. Uh, but if at some point, they will need to cooperate. So it's not a question to technology yet. Okay, uh, the next product, again, easier to see. Uh, we have a client, uh, UATEC. Their client is Jacobs. So we build the system that verify authenticity of the product. You know, everybody has seen the, the QR codes and holograms and labels that say this product is authentic. And I even seen the uh, I know, Gucci slippers that say that it's written on them, not fake, you know, so um, model sold. So, but effectively, validating these uh, labels is impossible for the user. So you need to have an informational system that involves like mobile application that involves the user. So the user can trace the, the product from the region point, and see this supply chain or so. And uh, for that, you need cryptography. You need uh, unique uh, codes, unique on each product which adds to price obviously but the only way to protect the product obviously you can uh, buy the original product take the you know, label from it with unique qr code put it on the uh, fake product uh, but then somebody who will be buying um, yeah uh, the real product will ask okay where is my label you know? <laughs> so 
effectively you, you can eliminate most of the cases of fraud unless the user knows that the buyer knows that they are buy, buying fake product and they are fine with that. So uh, this case uh, at some point will be applied to every product sold in the world and such systems are already being deployed. Um, so it's not rocket science, uh, but the complicated part is synchronization between parties. So it's easy to build centralized system where one company knows about the whole supply chain and retailers, and the products. But if you want to achieve, like in the previous question of Alexander, global trust, you need uh, cooperation of systems and where blockchain can help to share uh, such data in a secure manner. So no one is um, having full control over the system and can manipulate data. Okay, this is the last part and we have only one case. It's the most complicated and uh, just one example. Um, I kind of touched a little bit about that financial systems do not communicate with each other because APIs are usually closed. There is no like global standard for digital identity. And yeah, you need intermediaries. But in some time, 10 to 20 years, there will be protocols and common standards for identity, for ownership, rights, for data exchange, and then we will have like, say, call it financial internet. Then it will be much easier to trade and communicate. Um, almost every blockchain project claims that they're building that, say in global financial infrastructure or yeah, anything like that, but it's super hard to build. And it, it cannot be one company that builds that and then says, use it. It should be that they use it from the delivered it from the bottom. So companies start adopting certain best practices and protocols. And then uh, the standing and they, they can cooperate using this software. So I think that's the only approach. And it definitely shouldn't be a single blockchain between everybody. It has a lot of problems, uh, security issues and um, performance issues. So I think it should be like internet or like email or everyone can work independently, but one can connect to others when needed using the same like language of communication. So financial internet is yeah, the uniform language between independent bodies. So example that's currently uh, out there, it's our JV as well, also my stakeholder is the network of car auctions. Uh, so the problem is uh, currently you can sell a uh, car only on one auction platform, because if you put it on two, then the auction cannot be uh, synchronized. So people place bids and it won't be consistent. So we synchronize the bidding process. And uh, so the same car can be simultaneously traded on the auction in multiple countries. So there won't be any problem with who won the auction and for how much. So the, it solves the real-time synchronization. And it could be as many uh, platforms as you like. And um, yeah, they can connect, disconnect. There is no yeah, uh, kind of some requirements. So currently we jump started with uh, cars from the US, Europe and Japan. The project is already like three years old. It received uh, money from Techstars in Berlin. Um, I was there too. Then from Y Combinator. Then it received $1 million from public Japanese company. Now another round was closed a few months ago. So it sells uh, 100, like 1,000 cars per month. So everybody who is connected can use our liquidity, pay us for that liquidity, or even uh, buy the white label auction website, which is much better than yeah, in many cases available. So this is the example how trade can be yeah, improved using blockchain. So we have real-time synchronization between auction platforms. The same concept can be applied for real estate, trading, you know, selling uh, houses, 
we are looking for partners in that space uh, or maybe other assets. So that's, that's the situation. Uh, that was all for use cases. We have actually many more, but uh, this uh, what we could fit in one hour, a little bit more, and uh, more or less vividly explain where blockchain is needed. It's not for issuing tokens. So I um, didn't say that. Um, it's not for um, just adding value to a project. I mean, value in terms of investment value. It, it does, but um, not for first for adding value to the business model and to technology to eliminate uh, issues and so on and so forth so effectively what's going on is that uh, blockchain becomes like enterprise grade and it will be mainstream quite soon uh, not tomorrow uh, because still i think only a fraction of a percent companies ask for blockchain um, with a reason, not just, oh, we want it, but they have the problem that they need to solve and they feel that the, this tech can help only a fraction of a percent. But uh, mainstream adoption will happen in two, three, five, ten 10 years, depending on the industry, in some faster, in some much longer. But in 20 years, I think every system that will, yeah, would be around modern more or less will be using blockchain in some way without talking too much about that the same way like uh, radio waves are used everywhere and nobody's saying oh my product uses radio waves 